I guess that's how you make an entrance. Something like that. Yes, right. Pretty wild. Um, you see, Brian here, he's putting a diaper down underneath my bike. Hey, hey, what are you laughing at? Here's the thing. No, 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 here's the thing. A lot of you guys have heard, and you think that Harleys leak oil, and bikes like this, they do not leak oil. They just mark their spot. That's what they do. I mean, when you get to be, uh, yeah, you, you mark your spot. That's all I can say. Um, you know, this really is a beautiful bike. It's like a, a thing I've dreamed of, something I've always wanted. And I've had it, it was built by a guy in church here, uh, Mark Calhoun, and everybody knows him as Stack, three years ago. I want to thank him. He built this thing. This, it's like incredible. This thing's badass, I'm telling you. Um, you would never say that in your church. Um, and you would never let me say it in your church. Um, uh, it's really wild is the, the paint job, and I really encourage you to come on up after the service and take a look at it because the paint is incredible. On the front, between the handlebars here, there's a graveyard scene that's just, the detail is amazing. And it's got the, you know, the subtle skulls all over it along with the bold skulls. And just a real quick comment. People ask me, because I wear skull jewelry, I got tattoos and skulls, and I got skulls on everything. People ask me, what's with the skull? I'm going, I like them. That's it. That's it. I mean, there's nothing spiritual about it. There's not whatever else, you know. And, and I got a big ta a skull tattooed on my shoulder. And in the, in the circles that I keep around, you know, church people, religious people, every once in a while, I will get this indignant kind of, well, why do you got that tattoo? And I look at him and I go, just to irritate religious people. <laughs> Looks like it's working. <laughs> By their, oh, their response. You know, anyway, I'll tell you what, this is not, most bikes like this are a trailer queen. They live on a trailer. They go from bike show to bike show. This one doesn't. If you look at it, it's got rock chips on it. And it does mark its spot wherever it goes because it's ridden. I ride it. One last thing, I, uh, before I really get going here, I want to just uh, thank uh, the Blue Knights. Some of you uh, Maranatha people, you've possibly seen me wearing this vest or my jacket in the past, but for those of you who haven't, um, I am an official member uh, by invitation a few years ago by the Blue Knights, and the Blue Knights uh, is a motorcycle organization that are strictly limited to police, uh, active or retired police officers uh, who ride motorcycles to promote safety and get around and it's just really a it's just a great group man a bunch around bunch of old farts all the time <laughs> um, you know th this year there's quite a contingency of the blue knights that'll be going through and we really do honor our our police officers those that serve us and protect us that way but this year also, there's going to be quite a nice little contingency of the Red Knights. Now, if the police are the Blue Knights, who do you suppose the Red Knights are? The Fire Department. You're right. And you should, you should check this out. Those two do not get along. I mean, I, hear, I have to hear jokes from the police officers all the time. Things like this. The reason why God created police officers is so that firefighters would have heroes. That's, I know, I know, and I'm not a police officer, so I sit, I just kind of sit quiet and listen to some of this banter. I just go, whoa, man, oh man, um, it really is uh, quite a treat. Uh, just, that, just, just for the uh, sake of a quick recognition, uh, the Blue Knights and the Red Knights who are here in the building right now, would you guys just stand? I know there's a lot coming to join them later, but those of you who are here, would you stand? Yeah. Over there. We really do appreciate all of the people that serve us. I mean, our military, police, uh, ambulance drivers, you know, uh, people that, that uh, firefighters, uh, anybody who's in the service industry, they serve us and they are so easily forgotten. And we take 
that for granted that they're there. Um, it, it's kind of like, you know, when you're in the back alley doing something you shouldn't do at 11 o'clock at night, you don't want to see a police officer. But if you're in the back alley and there's some things happening around you, you really want to see a police officer. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Praise God. Uh, I'm going to take this off only because it's warm up here. So, but yeah, I am a... Uh, I get a chance to hang around those guys and try to straighten out some of them. It's okay. I think I missed something. Um, yes, I did. Thank you, Dave. I will find out later, <laughs> and we will have to deal with it. <laughs> um, hey, guess what? Judy made it in here for her birthday. Uh, Judy, happy birthday! Where are you, Judy? Where are you? Where is she? Stand up. Come on, Judy is 39 years old today. <laughs> 39. Hey, you know, I really want to give a, just a real quick shout out and thanks to all the people that it takes to, to put something like this on. All the workers at Maranatha, I mean, literally there's hundreds because just the, the minutia of details and things that have to happen. And we also have about 10 guys from Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge. They came up to help work the parking lot too, so we really appreciate that. But if you see Perry and Michelle Ingram, they are in charge of this event, and I'm hoping and praying that they still talk to each other tonight when it's over. <laughs> it's just very busy, very intense, very packed with all kinds of you know, things to do. Uh, but I just really want to give a thanks to all those who made it out And then thanks to all you guys for coming out Because it's a privilege to be able to have you drive through the lobby And you'll be getting more specific instructions later Right before we leave I'll tell you And the parking lot people are quite, quite honestly Going to handle it so well that they're going to direct you It'll be fully understanding, understandable where you're supposed to go And what you're going to do Amen? Amen? Amen, there we go I have to admit, those of you who were here last year I, I personally would choose this weather over last year a little bit just because last year, it's like I felt like I was a roast in the oven. Let's just keep rotating and, you know, turn until done. I, I told my wife several times, the buttons popped out. I'm done. <laughs> Praise God. You know, it really is an interesting thing and to realize that, you know, when we come to church, I want people to always understand, and, and for those of you who are guests, listen, I want you to understand, I'm not preaching at you today. I just realized that you're here with us, but, I, but this is just Sunday for us, and, and I want to remind everybody that, you know something, it's all about Jesus. Everything we do, it's all about Jesus. Every church, the Catholics, the Lutherans, the Baptists, the Episcopals, the E Free, the Christian Missionary Alliance, every church that's meeting today and all the people that are in there, we gather together week after week. Why? It's all about Jesus. It's to proclaim his love. It's to share with others the good news, to tell them about the change that Jesus brought in our life. It's to talk about the things that Jesus taught, to follow Jesus' example. I mean, it's all about Jesus. Start out in Luke chapter 1, verses 30 and 31. It's the encounter with the angel uh, telling Mary that she's going to have a baby. Verse 30 says, And then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Interesting, that name of Jesus is really what it's all about. The name of Jesus. Eight days after Jesus was born, as was the custom then, uh, if you had birth, you gave birth to a male child, eight days later you're supposed to bring him back to the temple, dedicate him to the Lord, and have him circumcised. So Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple on the eighth day. And there was a man in the church there, his name was Simeon. And Simeon, kind of an interesting character. He was, he, he was uh, like a blue knight. He was an old guy. I am not going to be able to go to the next meeting. I can tell you that. Um, 
that, that, yeah, he, he was an old guy, and here's the deal. He, he was told by God that he would not die until he saw the Messiah, until his eyes saw the Savior of the world, the one that was prophesied 700 years earlier by the prophet Jeremiah. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And you shall call his name Mighty God, Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Simeon was kind of like, wow. Now, here's what's real interesting. I'm going to diverge just for a moment here. There's a lot of people running around saying that they've heard God tell them when Jesus is coming back. If, you, if somebody tells you they know when Jesus is coming back, slap them. <laughs> just slap them. Because they do not know what they're talking about. Jesus said, no man knows the day nor the hour. Not even me. Only my Father which is in heaven. Um, th that kind of thing is kind of crazy. My mother, true story, she got married believing that Jesus was coming back in two years. The teaching of the church that she was going to at the time, they said that Jesus was going to be coming back in two years. So in 19... Let's see, I was born in 15. By 1958, late 57, 50, they were married for a couple of years, so she had determined that, wow, I want to get married before Jesus comes. I don't want to be, so I, I want to get married. I want to do, do that, and I, you know, and so she thought, here's what she said. She said, I can do anything for two years. <laughs> Thinking that, hey, if this thing turns south, you know, uh, she could endure anything for two years. <laughs> that was 60 years late, 60 years ago. They've been married 60 years. My mother has a halo the size of the biggest saucer plate you've ever seen. <laughs> and if you met my father, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Not just my dad. Every one of us bums. Any, you ladies who are married to us, you are a saint. You are a saint. Really, you got to put up with us. I mean, man, you, you're beautiful, you're lovely, you're like, we're, we're ugly. God, we are ugly. Every one of us. I've never seen a good-looking guy in my whole life. If you have, you be careful. <laughs> Think about it. I remember... In high school, they talked about, you know, this was after a while after high school, um, that Jesus was coming back in 1982. And then he didn't. They, they changed it. They wrote a book, a little pamphlet. Somebody put out 88 reasons why Jesus is coming in 1988. Do you remember that? Here's the thing. The Bible says no man knows when he's coming back again. But when Simeon was told by the Lord, see, nothing, nobody said anything about that. The Lord told Simeon, you're going to see the Messiah before you die. Wow. So Simeon is there. He goes to the temple. Luke chapter 2, verses 20, beginning of verse 28. He goes to the temple, and Mary and Joseph are there, along with baby Jesus. It says, and he took him up in his arms, and he blessed God. And he said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. So cool. He is seeing it and holding him, and by the Holy Spirit, he knew this is it. When he acknowledged that he was seeing the Messiah, the anointed one, the savior of the world, he, he said to God, God, thank you. You've been true to your word. I am free to die now. I am free to leave because I have seen your salvation, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles, a savior for the whole world. Verse 33, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Verse 34, very interesting. And then Simon blessed them and he said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Really encouraging, huh? I just think that's an interesting phrase. This child will be a sign, for, a setup for the rising and the falling of many, and will be a sign that will be spoken against. 
I tell you what, I, if you're a parent at all, you think about um, when your kids get hurt, you hurt. I mean, people could not hurt you more than when they attack your kids. I mean, I remember we have four kids, two boys, two girls. We have nine grandkids. And our oldest, Samson, he was about, I don't know, maybe six, seven years old, somewhere in there. And the neighborhood boys in town, when we lived here in town, the neighborhood boys, by the little older ones, the, the 10 to 11-year-olds, they'd come hang out at my house because I had cool stuff. I had motorcycles and hot rods. You know, I always had a Cuda or a Challenger or a Roadrunner or something like that in the garage that I was making noise with and, you know, letting the police know where I was. <laughs> so they'd hang out, and I was, you know, cool to minister to the kids and, you know, having a good time and all that. One day, Samson came in, big old crocodile tears coming down his cheeks. And I says, what's wrong? He says, they won't play with me. And I tell you what, seeing him hurt, and the kids that I am kind to in the neighborhood, that play, they wouldn't accept him. They wouldn't play with him. You couldn't have hurt me more just watching him cry, feeling that sense of rejection and that sense of hurt. Here, Simeon says... Your son is going to be a sign that's going to be a reproach, that's going to be spoken against. You know, if you think about it, his prophecy was very, very accurate. Because from that day to this, there is no other name that arouses so much passion as the name Jesus. It's either excitement or hatred. The discussions, the arguments, the passion, the belief, the disbelief, the love, the hate. Rarely does the name of Jesus dropped in a conversation is it met with indifference. The name of Jesus really causes a rise. It causes an emotional effect. You can talk about God all you want. But there's something about when you mention the name that's above every other name, the name of Jesus, that people have a reaction the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus people have endured ridicule for centuries they've endured rejection they've endured persecution torture they've been stoned they've been sawed in two they've been burned at the, fl- at the stake they've been recently beheaded as recently in recent years We see those 30 Egyptians out on the beach that were beheaded by some radical Muslims. And the only reason was because they confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. I grew up in a a pretty religious house. We went to church every Sunday. I went to eight years of parochial school. I figured my life was pretty average, but I'm realizing that's not. My mom and dad were never divorced. Um, They weren't alcoholics. They weren't drug addicts. They did not beat us unless we deserved it. (laughs) You know, there there is a a beating that is, you know, suitable. The the Bible says, spare the rod, spoil the child. Now, that doesn't mean you beat the child. You should never hit a child out of anger, but there's something about causing a little bit of correction. You know, uh, for you teenagers, pay attention. That same verse can be used for you when getting your driver's license. When you ask your dad for the keys and he says, oh, I can't give you the keys, and you look at him and say, Well, you hate me, then the Bible says. And he's going to look at you like, What? And then you quote that verse. The Bible says, He who spares the rod hates his son. You know, I don't want to tell you the whole long story, but this name of Jesus was kind of interesting. You know, again, around the house and talk about God and everything else, but but every once in a while, these people would bring up this name Jesus, like as if he was real, and like they knew him. It was like, wow. Now, I I grew up up, up in South St. Paul, and the summer after my eighth grade year was the first time that I started drinking because, you know, I had moved from this parochial school into the public school, and I had a big old afro, and... um, and girls are stupid. <laughs> Ladies, please, I love you. Take this in the grain of salt that I'm talking about. So listen, hear me out, okay, before you just check out. But here's the thing. The, the new kid in school shows up. There's just this natural, hmm. You know, this, hmm. 
You just, you, you check it out. It's kind of like you do in the morning, in the mirror, every morning when you do the little butt check. You, gotta, you, you just, you check it out. With an afro, and, and then I was in wrestling, and I, I got some amount of, you know, popularity. And so the summer after my eighth grade year, I started going to parties, invited to parties and drinking and that kind of thing. And, and then one of my buddies worked at a, a car wash, and he found, cleaning a car one day, he found two joints in the car while he was cleaning the car out. So he found another thing, you know. I remember, I'll never forget the night we were upstairs in, in the upstairs part of his garage, and we were going to, there was this like this great unveiling of the, of the marijuana. And, and I remember, you know, anxious and nervous and excited, and what's this going to do? And I remember smoking it and excited. My brother, my, my younger brother, nine months and nine days younger than me. Yeah, my mom wishes we were twins. Um, he... He was saying, Mike, don't do this. This is drugs, man. Don't do this. You become a drug addict. You know, don't, don't do it. And I'm just like, no, nah, don't worry. It's no big deal. It's no big deal. It's just marijuana, you know. And, and I remember smoking that. And Friends, can I tell you this? Sin will always take you farther than you want to go and cost you more than you're willing to pay. In so many areas of your life, people tell you, don't hang around those kind of people. Don't do this. Hey, sin will take you farther than you were willing to go and cost you more than you were willing to pay. Oh, nobody's going to find out. It's okay. I'm just going to do this. For, I'm just going to do it this once. I'm going to do it this just a little bit. Never works out that way. I remember that time we didn't get high, but because we'd crossed that threshold, I was anxious for more. And you know, the Bible says even, if you're looking for something, you're going to find it. So I started smoking pot. I really liked it. I mean, it liked me. It did, because it always showed up where I was. I remember thinking to myself, never am I going to drink and smoke pot at the same time because that shows a life that might be out of control. So I drew that line in the sand saying, never am I going to drink and smoke pot at the same time. Well, you know, it wasn't very much longer. I'm at a party, I'm drinking, smoking pot. So then I had to draw a new line. Never will I do anything harder than marijuana. And then I'm smoking hash, and then I'm doing speed, and then I'm doing cannabinol, and then I'm doing PCP, angel dust, putting it in your joint, and I, I remember in high school, I, I have brought a pound of marijuana to school and have it sold by third hour. I had cut up cannabinol in, on my, in, in during this class, take out my pocket, the little tinfoil, put the, put the cannabinol on the table, take my razor blade out, cut it up, roll the dollar bill up, and snort it right during class. I remember thinking to myself, never will I do anything harder than, never will I drink, smoke pot, and do drugs at the same time. My life was turning into a mess. And I won't go into it. In, in fact, my mom was in the first service, and I was kind of having some fun with it, but a little bit of a... Mm. I said, I had to stop right about here, and I said, Mom, have you heard this before? <laughs> because, uh, you know, maybe I would like to ask you just to step out of the room for a few minutes. And, but I think she's kind of heard, you know, more and more. And I said, listen, I, even the first service and even now, I'm not going to go into... And, and, Tell my mom about the times that you know guns were present and guns were drawn and a drug deal in St. Paul and I could have easily I mean just the life that you get involved in that you never intended to be there. Well, right around the same period of time, my mom became born again. My mom accepted Christ as her savior. Her life radically changed. A year later, my dad asked Christ to come into his life. His life radically changed. They went from being just religious church going people to this somehow or another talking about Jesus like as if he was real, like he was in the room, like he was there with you, like he walked with you and talked with you along life's narrow way, like he really cared. And it was incredible. And I started to believe and listen to other churches because now we started going to other churches. And I remember hearing what the Bible says. And I remember when I heard it, I, I, I thought, you know, that is true. I knew it was true. I mean, John 3, 16, I've heard it read before, but when you hear it read or quoted from somebody who has a relationship with God, not just a belief in God, it makes all the difference in the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish 
but I have everlasting life. I remember hearing in the Bible where it says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus said, John 3, 3, unless a man is born again, he will in no wise see the kingdom of heaven. 1 John 5, 12, it says, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. John 1, 12 says, to all who received him, to them he gave the power to become children of God. Which begs a natural question. If all received him, how do you receive him? Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and live with him. You see, Jesus Christ is a gentleman. He'll never go where he's not invited. And I'm sitting and hearing meetings in, in services like that, hearing a message like this, church, and I'm realizing that, you know, it's, it's not about... At this point, what, what God did for me, I have to respond to what he did. Not just believe it, but receive it. And I remember it was a service at the high school when I was the first one out of my chair and went down there to receive Christ as my Savior because I heard him knocking at the door of my heart and I basically said, Jesus, I want you in my life. Would you please come into my life? Forgive me of my sin. I ask you and invite you to come into my life. And let me tell you what. I went from being somebody who believed in God to knowing that he exists. Somebody who, who believed that God was around to knowing that he was around. Why? Because he walked with me and talked with me. That God, this thing of Christianity was something more than just a religion. It was real. And I mean, I'm, I'm like excited. It changed. It radically changed my whole life. People every once in a while will ask me, so how did you quit doing drink? How, how did you quit alcohol and drugs? Did you go to treatment? Nope. And this ain't, I mean, please hear me right. Hear, hear me and think this through, through. I had dabbled in it, and I'd kind of go away, and then I'd go back to it, and then I'd, you know, I'd love God, and things were going well, and I'd you know, pick. Eventually, here's why I quit doing drugs. Because they got in the way of my relationship with Christ. My love relationship with Christ got and grew so, so intense that I finally decided, you know, I want you alone I don't, this other stuff keeps messing and getting in the way. I don't want that anymore. I want you. Now I remember back in that time before I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life, um, we might go with my parents to these other churches or evangelistic meetings like Billy Graham and different things like that. Every time they sang this song called Amazing Grace, I'm thinking to myself, all these churches, they sing, it's like every, they sing this song almost every Sunday, Amazing Grace. And I started thinking to myself, is this the only song they know? I mean, it's Amazing Grace. So here we are again, Amazing Grace. And I have to admit, in church, pay attention. One of the things that kind of surprised me was they sang it like they really kind of didn't care. It sounded like kind of an important song, but I heard it and heard it and heard it, and I was kind of whatever else. But let me tell you something. After I surrendered my life to Christ... I went to church the next Sunday and they sang the song Amazing Grace and I sang it and heard it in a whole new way. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound had saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And I realized that they sing that song because it's a great song. The only thing is, someone needs to remind them to put the passion back in their singing of it. To remember where you came from. Oh, it became just a great song. It's a marvelous song. I quickly realized after I had, you know, surrendered my life to Christ, and now I'm around churches and Christians a lot more. I mean, like, like Christians who, who act like you and I do. And I realized right away that Man, some of these people are kind of weird. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I run into this idea that they're, they're all a bunch of, bunch of don'ts. Don't do this, don't do that. And, and I mean, here's the thing. I had a stereotype of what it means to be a Christian. And I know that a lot of people have stereotypes of what it means to be a Christian. Some people's stereotype is to be a Christian means you go to church on Sunday. To some people's stereotype, their image of, of being a Christian is that you believe that there's a God and that he sent his son Jesus into the world. And that's a nice starting place, but some people believe being a Christian is about being a good person. 
Now, Christianity will make you a good person, but being a good person doesn't make you a Christian. See, I had these stereotypes, like I said before I give my life to the Lord, that, that there was a God, but he was far away. The God I believed in was, imperson- he was impersonal, and he was anxious to punish. And then I started realizing that, and I say this because maybe some of you in this room have this image and this perception, this stereotype of who God is. You believe in him, but he's far away. Almost like, why bother him? You know, it's, it's a lie. He's not far away. The Bible says he's as near as the mention of his name. All those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He hears their voice. This idea of being impersonal, every once in a while you think he's impersonal. God, he's got a lot of people to take care of. I mean, Lars Larson keeps him busy all the time, and his wife Linda is even worse. It's like, man, you know, he's busy all the time. Like, God's too busy to, to, to care about you. The Bible says he knows everything about you. He knows everything you've did, everything you're going to do. The Bible says he knows the words that are going to be coming out of your mouth that you haven't even spoke yet. He knows everything about you. He's got the very hairs of your head numbered. That's how intimate. He's not impersonal. He's very personal. I had this idea that he was anxious to punish. Maybe it's because of the way I was living. (laughs) Some of you in this room right now, you feel like, you don't deserve God's love. I tell you this, you don't, but he loves you anyway. You feel like he can't forgive you because he's anxious to punish. And you're, 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 you're afraid that someday you're gonna stand before God and, and he's just gonna give it to you. That's a lie. God is not anxious to punish. He's anxious to forgive. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just and forgives you of all unrighteousness. He came to pay the price for our sin. All these stereotypes, man, they were just like blown out of the water. I'm realizing everything that I thought about God was wrong. When you start reading the Bible, you realize that he's not far away. He's very near. He's not impersonal. He's very personal. He's not anxious to punish. He's anxious to forgive. He's full of love. I mean, everything changed. And then these Christians, I I found right away, a bunch of don'ts. Don't do this and don't do that and don't do this and don't do that and don't, 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 don't. And I'm like, This was driving me crazy. I'm thinking, you people are like a bunch of sticks in the mud. Let me don't, don't, don't. I think maybe that's maybe why my favorite Bible verse is John 10, 10. If I could have only one Bible verse to carry me through from now until Jesus comes, it would be John 10, 10. For me, it sums up what life is all about. It sums up what the Bible is all about in one verse. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Do you realize that the devil, the enemy of your soul, he only has one purpose, and that's to steal from you, rob from you, kill from you, make your life miserable, cause bad things to happen in your life. Why? Because you are the object of God's affection. You are the object of God's affection. And the devil can't get at God directly, so just like Samson coming crying into my, coming crying to me because somebody hurt him, and that hurt me, the only way the devil can get at God is to hurt his object of affection you because he loves you that's the only way the devil comes only to steal kill and destroy but then listen to this Jesus said but I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly now I have to admit when I got saved man I'm full of abundant life and joy I just love Jesus man I I just love Jesus and then God called me into the ministry so now I'm in in Bible college I'm learning how to be a pastor (laughs) not really I'm learning how to do church work kind of stuff. But I'm finding myself right away, I don't fit in the mold that these people are like trying to put these people in. I'm like, I don't fit there. I'm like, this is crazy. God, because I love you. And I, I, if I had a nickel for every time somebody said to me two things, you don't act like a pastor, <laughs> I'd be a rich man. If I had a nickel for every time somebody said to me, you don't look like a pastor, I'd be a rich man. I have to admit, now that I'm a little older and I've learned that when people say to me, um, you don't look like a pastor, I say, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Because most of them have a persona of they're dead, dull, and boring. Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. You know, I want to challenge you, church, to be a burning bush. 
I want to challenge you to be a burning bush. In the book of Exodus, and it's a familiar story, you guys, y'all have heard it, y'all know it. Moses is up there taking care of uh, the sheep. He's wandering around. In Exodus chapter 3, don't bother turning it in your Bibles. Just look up here. You'll see it. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro's father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was not burning with fire. It was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. The bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Verse 3. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. I have to admit, I, when I read this idea and the concept, and God called me to the ministry, I'm thinking to myself, I think God wants every one of us as Christians to be like a burning bush. To be so on fire that we attract people's attention. You see, Moses was just doing his own business. He was minding his own business, doing, going the day-to-day things. But all of a sudden, something happened on the backside of that mount. There was a, a burning bush, and it got his attention. Friends, you and I are living our lives, and people are going through their daily lives, and you know something? They don't see anything worth looking at. The thing about the burning bush is it caused curiosity. Huh? There's a burning bush. Plus, which one of us doesn't like fire, unless it's in your house? I mean, I remember as a kid growing up in South St. Paul, we'd see the fire engines go by. Man, we would don our bicycles and battle our little legs off trying to see where the fire was. I mean, everybody's fascinated by a fire. You can go see it. Tell you what, the world needs to see Christians on fire. Get on fire, and people will come watch you burn. They'll come watch you burn. Just get on fire. The burning bush created curiosity. It created wonder. It kind of a, hmm... It invoked the natural question, why? See, you and I are supposed to live our lives that other people look at and they go, why does she do what she does? Man, if I had half the trouble she has, I'd commit suicide. But because you're a Christian, you know of the power and the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy and the love of God. You rise above all that. You're walking a different pace than everybody else. You're like a burning bush that people look at you and they go, why? How come they're not crumbling apart? How come they're not broken? Why? Because you have the presence of God burning within you. He has given me more joy, David said, than they have when their wine and their grain abound. The joy of living for Jesus is really what it's all about. It's kind of interesting. You know, you see this thing here. Friends, you need to realize this thing for me is just a thing. It really is. The joy in this life is not in our possessions. It's not in the things that's going to create an abundant life. No, the abundant life is created with peace and joy for Jesus inside. That is the abundant life. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Friends, you and I need to live our lives that captures people's attention. Just like Moses, they're walking around. I think people believe in God, but they've never really seen a real Christian. They've seen seen people who've confessed to be a Christian, but they're so bigoted, so small, so chintzy, always complaining, always whining, no joy in their life. Yeah, they don't smoke, drink, or dance, but you know something? They don't do anything else either. Me, I like to dance. I like to shout. I like to live. Because Jesus gave me a reason to. Amen? I remember coming into, into the Assemblies of God. It'd be kind of like the Baptist and the Christian Missionary Alliance and the Covenant and everything else too. I remember, it's not a big deal today to see a minister with a tattoo. But boy, back in the day, when I showed up around... The, Oh, my God. People are like, who let him in this club? <laughs> I was riding a motorcycle. Nobody was riding a motorcycle back then. I was the only pastor who rode a motorcycle. They were like, he, he rides a motorcycle. He rides a motorcycle. Like as if it was the, oh, my God, his biggest thing ever. And then when I got a tattoo, oh, 
oh my goodness, this thing was huge, man. I mean, everybody's seen it. It covered three, I mean, it was this one right here. <laughs> I remember when I got it, I had to think about it, I had to pray about it, because I knew it was going to rock people's worlds in the Christian circles, tattooing your body and everything else, and I knew it was like, I was like one of the first pastors that had a tattoo. I remember when I got it, I was convinced it covered my whole body. <laughs> oh my God! How, how am I going to hide that? It's, it's covering everything. It's everywhere. Now I'm branded for the rest of my life. It's here. Oh, it's here. I kept looking at it. Like, oh my God. Uh, no. Yeah. We need to get ready to go start blessing bikes. But I want to challenge you in this couple things church Jesus said you are the salt of the earth if the salt loses its flavor it's good for nothing do you want to be a burning bush Jesus said in Matthew 5 14 not only are you the salt of the earth but you're the light of the world you are the light of the world let your light so shine in such a way that others see your good works and give glory to your father which is in heaven in other words, you've got to live a life of joy. Live a life that's worth seeing. Live a life that's different than the world. Live a life that brings hope. Live a life that brings peace. Live a life that brings some joy to people. That creates the curiosity. Creates the wonder. That begs the natural question, why is he or she that way? In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. Very clear, succinct verse. It's marvelous. It says, for you were once darkness. I read this and I, I personalize it. I realize I was once in darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. I want to conclude with just two, two questions, two challenges. No doubt there are some of you here in this room. You cannot have a group this many people without having people that are a lot like me. You have a stereotype of what do you mean, what you think it means to be a Christian, like going to church or believing God, being a nice person. I can tell you what, while those are good things, that's not what being a Christian is about. Being a Christian is about having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, through re asking him to come into your life and being your Lord and Savior. No longer are you going to be in control of your life, but you're going to surrender your, the fact that he is God Almighty and you are not you have these stereotypes. I want to challenge you today to take a serious look at those stereotypes because most of them are wrong. You see, the sub, the, sub, the sub underlying ministry of my life is this. I believe everybody has a stereotype of what it means to be a Christian. And I want to break that stereotype because it's the stereotypes that's preventing people from falling deeply and madly in love with Jesus. The stereotype, yeah, the And then secondly, I want to challenge a lot of you in this room. You know, you, you call yourself a Christian, but my God, are you boring. <laughs> Not only are you boring, quite honestly, you're kind of toxic. You're negative. Don't do this and don't do this and don't. What about, what about the do's? Walk in forgiveness, walk in joy, walk in peace. Tell people, be gracious and generous to other people. Forget about all the do's. What about, the, what about all the don'ts? What about the do's? Here's the thing. If you're busy doing the do's, you ain't got time to do the don'ts. So then you don't got to spend all your time on them. All these people looking like they've been sucking on prunes, all self-righteous. When they're really not self-righteous, they just need to go to the restroom. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy. I thank you for the joy that you've put in my heart of knowing you. I thank you that I'm not very religious, but I'm madly in love with you. I'm so gracious for your salvation to know you. Father, I pray for every person in this room, those that possibly have stereotypes, like, well, I, I, I'm a member of this church and... and 
I'm a Christian because I go to the church and whatever the stereotype is, maybe they feel like they've done something so wrong, so bad that you can't forgive them. That is a lie. There is nothing that you can't forgive that you don't forgive. Father, I pray that you would break through the stereotypes that some people in this room have that are preventing them from surrendering their life to you. Father, I also pray as we are dismissed that you would help us who profess to know you, that you'd help us to live an abundant life, that we'd be that salt, that light, that we would be that burning bush in people's lives that would cause people to be curious and be drawn close to you. Father, we thank you for all this. Lord, even now, we pray for safety for all the motorcycles coming and going and cars and on the highways. As these people make their way back home as well, we thank you for your blessing. We pray a blessing over the food that we will enjoy as well. As we commit all this to you, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. It is so good to have all of you here with us this morning. You are welcome anytime to come back and join us, whether it's bike blessing or not. I really do invite you back. Here's the deal. There's going to be some pretty strict instructions because we want people to be safe. Some of you want to hang around the lobby. I don't believe they're going to let you hang around the lobby to watch. And if you are, it's going to be like in, back in that section. So as you mingle around out there, you'll find your way. Those of you with your bikes, you'll make your way out to your bikes. Plenty of time because I'm going to go out in just a few minutes. As soon as I change, I'm going to go out and address all of you from the PA system out there. So with that being said, you are dismissed to love and